In the previous video, I talked about two different basic ways of making calculations, Turing machines and lambda calculus. The rules have to be extremely simple because that's what they are made for. This series is supposed to be about functional programming, so I would say that you don't need to know everything about lambda calculus as long as you have a decent idea of pure functions and declarative programming. But since there are only around 10 videos on this topic in the entirety of YouTube, I thought that I can contribute something by giving a full explanation. I will explain it twice. The first time I will explain it in a logical way, and then for the second time I will get into all of the formal definitions and details. The logical explanation. The only thing that lambda calculus actually does is define how to create functions and how to call them. The way we typically create functions in math is by writing a statement such as fx equals to x plus 2. But here on both sides of the equation, nothing is directly the function itself. Wouldn't it make more sense to write what the value inside of f is? This way, you don't need an equal sign. It's just an expression like everything else in math. In lambda calculus, functions aren't anything special. They're just values like everything else. The Greek letter lambda is just a syntax keyword that means that you are creating a function. On the left, you have the name of the input, and then a period as a separator, and then what the function does on the right. This creates a function on the spot, so you can either immediately call it by passing in an input, which you do by writing the input on the right of the function, separated by a space. Or you can do whatever else you want to do with it, just like a value. Here are how lambdas are written in other languages, and you will see that they are the exact same besides a few characters swap out. Some of you might recognize them by the name anonymous functions or closures. Since functions can take anything as inputs, you can pass functions into other functions. This is common in programming, and you see it in callbacks, API requests, list mapping, etc. Which means for us, lambda calculus ideas are pretty useful. When we have functions as values, we can actually throw out all the numbers, strings, objects, or anything else at all, and only have functions work on functions. The reason that we don't need numbers is because the purpose of lambda calculus isn't to calculate anything useful, but just to study how functions work and interact with each other. So really, the only thing you can do in lambda calculus is write a variable, define a function, or call a function. And what each function can do is only those three things. But before we get into any complicated things, here is the formal explanation. A program is a lambda term, which is anything valid that you can write in lambda calculus. And we have three different kinds of lambda terms. The simplest is a variable written using a letter. The second kind of lambda term is one we've already seen, a function. This lambda term is created by attaching a variable on the left and some calculation or expression on the right. So how do we define what a calculation or expression is? It is just anything that's a lambda term. This means that for now, functions can either return a variable or another function. The variable that's the input of the function is different from other variables. It is a bound variable, which means it is just a placeholder for whatever value will be inputted. Other variables are called free and can represent any value. If this doesn't make much sense right now, just think of them as labels without meaning. And later, we have to treat these kinds of variables differently from each other. The third kind of lambda term is the act of calling a function or an application. We write the input separated by a space next to the function. In this example, y is being applied to the function lambda x, x, and in this case returns y itself. It might be confusing to think of function calling as a separate type of expression from just the functions themselves. It allowed us to write something that we weren't able to write before, inputs passed into functions. So really, it is a new kind of lambda term. The final small thing is that you can use parentheses for order of operations or marking where functions end, for example, anything you would use parentheses for in normal math or programming. Now, we have stated everything you can write in lambda calculus, but we haven't defined what they do yet. For now, both creating functions and calling them are just two different ways of connecting lambda terms together, making a new lambda term. Imagine if I said this, on both sides of a dot, you can place two shapes to create a quote sequence, and then you can join sequences together with a dash to make a bigger sequence. If you replace shapes with variables, terms with sequences, that's basically all I have explained so far. For lambda calculus to be useful, we have to somehow run or calculate the expression, not just write it. This is pretty obvious, but it's still important. Let's go back to normal algebra for a bit and take a look at this expression. We know rules like the distributive property, the fact that multiplying anything by 1 is itself, and so on that let us rewrite it. Simplifying a long expression into a shorter but equivalent one is exactly how computation happens in lambda calculus. Simplifying works almost the same as just running a program normally, and you can think of it the same way, except that you don't have to get all the way down to one value. If you pass x into the function f, and you don't know what f is, then the same thing happens. fx is the most simplified you can go, and that's all you have to do. 
The first rule for simplifying should be obvious. It comes from the idea that if you change the name of your variables, it shouldn't affect what the program does. If we have a function lambda x, x, we can rewrite it as lambda y, y. However, we can only do this for bound variables, the function inputs, because while we can say that these functions do the same thing, taking the variables out of the functions and saying x always equals to y, or a variable a is always equals to b, is incorrect. The second rule defines the idea of actually using the functions and calling them and passing inputs into them. For every function application, that is to say a function and its input, you can simplify it by removing the function, leaving only the right expression. Then you substitute every word the bound input variable appears with the actual expression. Now, with this rule, we can say that function application is equal to its output because it is just a rule for simplification. The word substitute is still pretty vague, so here's how it works. It's different from the first rule we talked about, rewriting function inputs, because this time it doesn't mean the expression before and after are equal, and you can just substitute anything. If we have the variable x and say we substitute x with y, it just becomes y. If we have another variable a and try to substitute x with y again, it still remains a because there's no x to substitute. A function lambda x y with y substituted for z will become lambda x z. You cannot substitute y for x though because there will be two different variables that are both called x, so you have to rename one of them using the previous rules we've seen before. In the same function, if you try to substitute x for z, it does not become lambda z y because changing bound variables or placeholders don't change the function. When substituting into an application fx, where f is any function and x is any expression, then we just substitute into both the function and the expression. Congratulations, you have now learned all of lambda calculus's syntax and how it works. Let's see some cool things it can do. Currying. When you write functions with any sort of complexity, you probably need something more than one input. But when we define functions in lambda calculus, you can only have one input, one bound variable. The first thing we could try to do is combine the two values into one value. With a more feature language, you can easily put two things into an array or topo. And so really, you aren't passing in two values, it's just another kind of value. This isn't that bad of an idea, because most programming languages do it this way. While you aren't explicitly making a tuple, it does basically the same thing. Lambda calculus, however, does it differently. You just write a function that takes only the first input, then have it actually return another function that takes the next input. The outer input, x, is bound all the way down and gets substituted into the inner function as well. This means that you can declare as many functions inside of each other as you want to give you as many bound variables or inputs as you want. We can write this in JavaScript or Python too. Then instead of passing in the parameters separated by commas, we just call the function twice. Once for the actual function, which returns another function. And so we call that return function immediately right there too. It does look a bit cursed, but in Lambda Calculus, because we write function application as just a space, it looks fine. A significant benefit of this is that when you pass in less parameters than the function expects, instead of filling in the rest with undefined values or giving an error, you just get back another function. And often you purposefully give it less inputs because it is very useful in functional programming. For example, you can use it to define a function based off another function with a couple inputs pre-entered. Add 5 equals to add where you pass in 5. This is so much cleaner than doing it normally, because you don't need to write extra piping just to pass the second input through. Converting between multi-input functions to this chain of functions is automatic. So for conciseness, you can even write functions like this with three variables on the right, as long as you know what is under the hood. This process is called currying, named after mathematician Curry, first name Haskell. In Haskell, the programming language, all functions are automatically curried, so it is very similar to lambda calculus in that regard. Church encoding and numbers. We don't have any numbers or values to work with by default besides lambda terms, which might seem like a big problem until you realize that nothing has numbers by default. Everything we looked at so far, Turing machines, computer RAM, and including lambda calculus, can't store the abstract concept of numbers directly. With binary, you can put numbers into a row of bits. The machine itself has no idea that numbers exist, it's just that we decided on a format to represent numbers. Similarly, in lambda calculus, while we can't store numbers into a variable, we can assign a particular lambda term to each number. For every number n, it is a function with input f and x, which returns f applied to x n times. 0 is x, 1 is fx, 2 is ffx, and so on. These functions don't have to do anything useful. It doesn't calculate the number, it itself is the number. This is called the church encoding, invented by Alonzo Church. If each number represents doing something n times, then to add numbers, say 2 plus 3, we do something twice, and then another 3 times, so that in total we did something 5 times. Let's run through how the exact calculation works. We convert them into church encoding functions. 
we pass two inputs f and x into three, which after substituting leaves the expression looking the same but removes the function part. Then for the first number, we pass in f again, but for the second input, we actually just pass in the number we did before so that this would get substituted into x. And here we have a chain of five functions. The church encoding has each number be a function, so we wrap the result with lambda fx. Here is a full definition of the add function, where m and n are the two numbers added. You might think that we need recursion for multiplication because it's just repeated addition. Turns out you don't. Basically, we do the act of applying a function three times, twice, so that in total we get six. To start, we pass f into three to keep it the same, but leave the x input empty. This results in a function that still takes one input, x. Now we just pass this entire thing into the function input of two, and then x for the second input so that it stays the same. If you substitute now, you get a chain of functions next to f, where each one is kind of like the addition we had before. So when you simplify each one again, they simplify all the way back down to fff, fffx, or 6. And like last time, we wrap it with lambda fx to make it a function again. Surely, exponentiation has to be complicated, but it's the easiest of all of them. When we want to calculate 2 to the power of 3, we just pass 2 into the first input of 3. And that's it. We just pass one number into the other in reverse order. By simplifying this yourself, you can do it in about 10 steps or so making sure to use the rule we had before to rename bound variables so that two different things don't accidentally have the same name. Basically, after you apply the number 3 to the first input of 2, the remaining input x becomes a normal function input for the result. So x is a new f in this case. And you can see that as a final result, there's actually two inputs. Both of them were originally x from some part of the function. Remember, the exact names of the inputs don't matter. It's just how they're substituted in that counts. To explain this is a little bit hard. But Wikipedia says that it's a natural result of how the numbers are defined, and another article points out that after some rearranging, it looks like repeated multiplication. Recursion. To make any language truly useful, we have to have some sort of ability for loops. Lambda Calculus does this with recursion, but not the way you would expect it to. Normally, we can have the function call itself, but functions don't have names when we define them, so we can't refer back to it. But take a look at this. We have the same function duplicated twice, so that one is applied to the other one. The function takes the input x and passes itself into itself. Let's try to simplify this expression based on what we learned before. We take the right expression, and for everywhere the x shows up, substitute in the input, which is a function itself. The result is actually the same as our original function. Immediately from this, you can tell that lambda calculus is far more complex than you think, and not everything simplifies neatly. If we say that simplifying is computing, this computation would never end. Now, we are very close to the recursion we want. Instead of an expression that simplifies to itself, can we change it for each step? The recursion happens wherever the term xx occurs, after we substitute into it. But we can also combine it with something else. Let's pass xx into a function f that isn't an input for now, but just a free variable that exists. Now, each time we substitute, the xx will become the entire function itself, but also have an f attached on the outside. Using this expression, you generate an infinite chain of functions applied to itself on some input. This is known as the y combinator. The only difference is that it's wrapped in an outer function that just lets you set what f is in the expression when you pass something in as input. All we need now is a cleverly defined function f. Let's see how we can convert a normal recursive function to use the y combinator. Just for convenience, I'm going to make use of numbers here and some pseudocode. You can do this in lambda calculus and church encoding as well. Here we have the factorial function, defined in the normal recursive way. It multiplies the current input with the factorial's result for the previous number. When it reaches 0, it returns 1 without recursion. If we pass in 5, it gives us 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 1. To change this to something that would work with the y combinator, all we need is for the function to take in another function as input in the beginning, in addition to whatever input we had before. Then replace where the function calls itself with the function input. This works because the y combinator creates an infinite chain of functions where each function has itself passed in as input. So all you need to do is take that function and call it. Even with an infinite chain of functions, the calculation stops because the function itself is in charge of when to call the next function and can decide to ignore it at any time. So in our case, after the number reaches 0, the function passed in doesn't matter anymore and it just returns 1 no matter what. As a conclusion, while much of what we looked at today isn't directly useful for Haskell or any language, such as the church encoding to represent numbers, 
but there are many general themes that stick around. Y Combinator is an example of a general function that can be used for recursion in any case. All you need to define for the special case of recursion is just a smaller non-recursive function that's passed into the Y Combinator. Something you might have noticed is that everything in lambda calculus is the same. It's all a lambda term. While you can technically pass anything into anything else when dealing with more complicated functions, you have to think about what kind of expression or variable or function, etc., would be useful to pass in to get the result you wanted. If you have other things to work with, like numbers or booleans, you have to make sure each function gets past the right thing. To solve all these problems, you need types, something that is far more complex than just saying that's an int, a string, or a boolean. Watch the next video to learn about category theory, the backbone of Pascal.